Good morning. Sorry. I'm tethered to the microphone, evidently. Um, I'd like to welcome you to Acadia National Park's 13th annual BioBlitz, which is part of our inventorying and monitoring uh, program. My name is uh, Ranger Kate Petrie, and I am the education coordinator uh, for the Scudic Education District. We have a, a counterpart on MDI as well. Uh, and we work over here in partnership with Scudic Institute uh, to run a variety of programs and, and mission. The biggest part of my responsibilities here, uh, in addition to working with wonderful programs like this, is to work with middle school students. And every middle school bus that I greet, I introduce the Park Service mission, which is very long-winded but well-written. Um, the essence of it is that we are here to protect and preserve everything in the park's boundaries, yet at the same time make it available for people to enjoy. And I assign each student to our residential education program the mission of evaluating whether or not we are achieving our mission. Are we protecting and preserving? And then I pose the question, how will we know if we don't know what we had here to begin with and if we don't know what has changed over time? Uh, for example, I can talk with the kids fairly easily about some of the stuff that's really well known to the public, like the reintroduction of the peregrine falcon or even the loss of uh, gray wolves from the 1800s. So they know there have been some changes. But far more uh, populous, larger in population, are our invertebrate populations. Uh, what are the new insects? Did we count everything to begin with? How would we know? And we start to talk about inventorying and monitoring. And then we look at the woods and, and Big Moose Island is roughly 110 acres or so. How are we going to count everything on it? And the kids' eyes get big. We start to talk about random sampling. This weekend has been a random sample uh, for a 24-hour period, working uh, with a number of partners, looking at a uh, particular order of invertebrates. Uh, and it's valuable to us, uh, both as a snapshot picture of what we have now, but also to compare to previous scientist collections from the early 1900s. And we're, we're very happy to have you come out and join us, and maybe even help us a little bit today. Uh, to get started, I'm going to introduce uh, Seth Benz, uh, who's our Scudic Institute partner, uh, and he's going to talk a little bit more about the particulars of our study. Um, we're going to hear about some of uh, the invertebrates that we're studying this weekend. And then we're going to give you a chance to uh, do a little hands-on uh, investigations as well. Seth. Thank you, Kate. My name is Seth Benz. I'm the director of the Bird Ecology Program here at the Scudic Institute. And as Kate mentioned, the Institute is uh, pleased to be hosting the annual BioBlitz, and we are the uh, we are a nonprofit partner of the park, uh, charged with helping the park uh, deliver its research and education programs. And we ourselves have our own programs, especially uh, ones that have to do with citizen science, inviting anyone from the public to get involved in our programs. Those programs are things like the Cadillac Mountain Hawk Watch that's been going on since 1994. Um, we have a new Sea Watch that's in its, this year will be its fourth year, that is at Scudic Point watching migratory seabirds and counting them, making observations. And we also have, this year will be the second year for a songbird migration monitoring effort um, called morning, uh, morning Flight. That takes place at Fraser Point. Um, also, we partner with various universities uh, in the area, and for instance, this particular fall we'll be studying um, fruit consumption of songbirds, migratory songbirds, with um, our postdoctorate fellow, Richard Feldman, who's somewhere in the audience, I thought, there he is right there, um, and 
To do that, we will be banding birds from mid-August all the way to the end of, um, uh, to the middle of October. And there may be some public opportunities to come out and witness that particular work and learn more about it. This weekend is devoted to, as Kate mentioned, inventory and monitoring of um, Hymenoptera, which are bees, wasps, and ants. And so yesterday we were out on Mount Desert Island in the principal part of the park collecting. Many of the people who are principal to that are now out on Skudik Peninsula this morning and they are collecting. So while they're doing that, we have this public program to um, hopefully educate you a little bit about what we're, what we're doing. So yesterday I'm happy to report that we came away with, uh, when we say bees and wasps and ants and things, those, some of those creatures are stinging um, beings. And we came away with, well, so far reported to me we've had four stings, none serious, everybody survived. So that's a good thing. Um, this morning, I'm happy to uh, introduce to you our, our subset uh, from Hymenoptera have been something called Myriapoda, many feet, um, centipedes and millipedes. And our guest lecturer, uh, present, presenter, is a, a student from the University of Connecticut who hails from Maine, and his name is Joseph DeSisto. I had the good pleasure of spending the day in the field with him yesterday um, of avoiding getting stung, but I learned some new things about what these creatures can do, um, mostly positive, and um, <laughs> um, it just depends on where you put your fingers sometimes. So, so after his presentation, which what we hope to do is have him speak for about 45 minutes or so, then have a little question and answer period, and then we're going to go out for a field demonstration and for those brave souls that want to get involved, um, you may be able to paw through a, a, a dead log or two, which we've, we've set out and hopefully made very, very safe. So we'll, we'll do that. And then following that field demonstration, for those of you that want to, we'll have a tour through the, the um, BioBlitz lab where people are processing the specimens that we collected all day yesterday and some this morning. Um, including some of the millipedes and centipedes that, that Joseph helped us find yesterday. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our good, now good friend, Joseph DeSisto, an excellent field naturalist. Thanks, Seth. Um, so I have two goals for today. Uh, you're not going to walk away from here knowing how to identify all the different kinds of centipedes and millipedes that we have in New England. Uh, that took me years to learn. Uh, but my goal for today is, I have two. One is you're going to know the difference between a centipede and a millipede, always. You'll always get it right. Uh, and the other goal is that I want you to know that centipedes and millipedes are just the coolest animals that have ever lived on this planet, which um, is my opinion, but it's right. So, um, so what is a centipede or a millipede? Well, this is a centipede. Um, I want you to notice a few things about it. One is that it's, its body is very flat. And that's an adaptation for getting into tight spaces like under the bark of a rotting log or between dead leaves in leaf litter or just burrowing in the soil. It also has these long antennae, which it uses as feelers, and it holds them out in front of its body to feel what it's going up against. These animals live almost in complete darkness their entire lives, uh, so their eyesight's very poor, their sense of smell is very poor, and most of what they know about the world comes from their sense of touch. This is a millipede, um, and right away you've already noticed a few differences between a millipede and a centipede. The millipede is more of a cylindrical animal. Uh, it's got very short antennae. These are the antennae up here. The face is kind of sort of tucked under the, under the head there. It's got many more legs than the centipede. The centipede we looked at had about 30 legs. It should be exactly 30, but it was missing some because centipedes get into fights with other centipedes and they lose their legs. Um, so that's, that's a, a good way to tell apart centipedes and millipedes. Centi uh, millipedes are often cylindrical. Uh, but this is also a millipede. This is a flat-backed millipede, and it looks a little more like the centipede, um, but it has more legs. It has two pairs of legs per segment like the millipede. Centipedes always have one pair of legs per segment. And it's got short little antennae up at the front. So it's a little confusing, but not, not too bad. Um, 
someone guess what this is? It's a centipede. You got it right. Good job. Um, it's one of the weirdest centipedes on the planet. It's found in the, in the Philippines, and it has evolved convergently with millipedes, which means that it looks more like a millipede than a centipede. It's one of the only centipedes that can do this thing, where it spirals up with its head at the center. If you flip over a log, sometimes you'll see millipedes, and they do that. They roll up into a spiral. Most centipedes just go berserk and start running all over the place. Um, the other thing that that the centipede has in common with millipedes is that it's very heavily armored. Millipedes have exoskeletons that are embedded with calcium salts, so kind of like a lobster or a crab, they're, they have a hard shell surrounding their body, whereas centipedes are more soft-bodied and squishy. Uh, and it's, no one really knows why this centipede is very similar to millipedes, but it's another interesting fact that this centipede actually specializes in eating millipedes and what the connection is between those two is unknown. You might think that it looks like a millipede so it can sneak up to millipedes easier, but millipedes are mostly blind, so that wouldn't really help. Uh, uh, this is a millipede, and it looks a lot like a centipede. Um, it's from Taiwan, and other than that, nothing is known about its natural history, because not very many people study millipedes. It looks a lot like the stone centipede that we saw earlier, the first slide, um, but you can notice that each of these is a segment, and each segment has two pairs of legs. So millipedes go by the Latin name diplopoda, which means double leg. They have two pairs of legs per segment, whereas centipedes always have only one. So what is a centipede, though? It's not just you know, a myriapod with one pair of legs per segment. That's not very interesting. More interesting is that centipedes are predatory, always. They're venomous, always. They have fangs at the front of the body they use to inject venom. They have lots of legs, always at least 15 pairs, unless they're missing some because they got bitten away. And they're usually fast moving. This is an evolutionary tree of the five different orders of centipedes. I'm not going to go into it because it's not that interesting, and it's also wrong. But I do want to impress upon you that centipedes evolved around 430 million years ago. They were one of the first animals to emerge onto land. They're among the oldest living land arthropods. Um, and today, we have about 3,300 known species of centipedes in five orders, um, but probably many times that have not been discovered yet. So I'm going to talk about the four. We have four of the five centipede orders here in North America. One of the orders is only found in New Zealand and Tasmania, so if you, found, if you find one, you've taken a wrong turn. But the, one of the oldest, the oldest centipede order are the house centipedes, or the scatidromorphs. Uh, you sometimes will see these centipedes in your home. Here in New England, we just have one species, and it's introduced from Europe, and it likes to live in buildings where it eats silverfish and cockroaches. These centipedes are unique in that they have really long legs. They're extremely fast runners, and their legs are autonomous. So if you touch one, it'll drop its legs to avoid being caught. But what's always amazed me is that a house centipede can drop up to half of its legs and still keep running just as fast. Uh, you'll also notice that, that's the wrong laser pointer, uh, th these are the hind legs and these are the antennae, and they mimic each other. So if you were a bird going to attack this centipede, you might get confused and attack the, the back end, and then the centipede can just drop its legs and make an easy escape. The other unique thing about these centipedes is that they have compound eyes, just like insects, so they're the only myriapods that have really good eyesight. And they hunt during the day, and they can run down flies and even uh, other flying insects that have landed. Uh, the most diverse order of centipedes in New England is the stone centipedes. This was the one that I showed you first and told you it was a centipede. Unlike the house centipedes, they're flat. They're, they're uh, dorsoventrally eventually flattened so that they can sneak into tight spaces in leaf litter and between the bark of, of rotting logs and under rocks. They, are, they have a very different lifestyle. They live, like I said, in almost complete darkness, and so they use their long antennae as whips to sort of feel around in front of them and tell if they've bumped up against something that they can bite or if they've bumped up against something that they should run away from. And they always have uh, 15 pairs of legs. You won't find this centipede in New England, I promise. This is an, an eight-inch-long giant centipede from Africa. Uh, 
And, they, and there are centipedes that get even bigger than that. Uh, these are the bark centipedes, and they always have 21 or 23 pairs of legs. This order includes all the giant centipedes, the ones you might see in a pet store, uh, and the ones that can give you a really nasty bite. Um, bark centipedes isn't their official common name, I just made it up, but that's all that common names really are, or just names that people make up, so uh, I called it. And this is the, the most recently evolved order of centipedes. These are the soil centipedes. Um, this is only half of its body, the rest of it is under the soil. These are very long-bodied centipedes with lots of legs, 29 pairs of legs up to more than 200 pairs. And they actually don't have eyes. So you can partially excuse this centipede for trying to attack an earthworm that's probably much too big for it to kill uh, because it has no way of seeing what's in front of it. These, these centipedes live almost entirely under the soil and they hardly ever see light in their normal lives unless you were to pick, unless you were to uncover them. Uh, so we talked a little bit about how many legs centipedes can have. Stone centipedes up at the top have 15. This is a bark centipede that you might find in New England. It's got 21 pairs of legs. And this is an introduced centipede that I recently discovered a population of them in New York City. It wasn't known in the United States until then. Uh, but it's a European species that can have you know, 80 or more pairs of legs. But it gets a little bit complicated because with the stone centipedes and the house centipedes, the ones with 15 pairs of legs, they actually start out their lives with fewer pairs of legs. So if you find a centipede with 13 or 11 or 9 pairs of legs, it's still a centipede, uh, but it's a, it's a young version of a stone centipede or a house centipede. And each time they molt, as they grow, they add legs. It gets even worse with the soil centipedes because in soil centipedes, within a population of the same species, you can find specimens with different numbers of legs. And usually the females have more legs than the males. So this is a, a graph just showing the number of legs of a group of centipedes that I was looking at that had been collected on a single mountain, a mountain in Oregon. Uh, the centipede, of course, is right there. Uh, red is females, blue is males. And what's interesting about this population is that if you chart um, the number of legs versus the sex of the centipede, you'll see that it sorts into two groups, one with males, have, with males with 33 and females with 35, and then another group where the males have 37 and the females have more than that. And so what this might indicate is that there are actually two species of centipede here where there's only one that's been described. Um, but hopefully genetic work will tease out the relationships and tell us if we actually have a new species of centipede on this mountain. Uh, one of the other interesting things about soil centipede segment numbers, because there's variation in the number of legs that a population can have, you can come up with all sorts of interesting trends. And one of them that's been pretty well studied is that centipedes from northern latitudes tend to have more legs of the same species. So this, uh, these scientists collected centipedes from the, all these sites in, in Britain, and they charted the number of legs, uh, and they found that at lower latitudes, Consistently, the centipedes had more legs. And it's not totally sure why that is, but generally a larger body size is better for cold environments, uh, as some of you might know from living in Maine. Uh, this is, I just was, wanted to show you some basic anatomy of a centipede. So this is the head of a stone centipede. It's a common species in New England. So this is one of the ones with 15 pairs of legs, remember. It has not compound eyes, but a bunch of simple achelae, or kind of simple eye spots that can sense light and dark, but they can't really form an image. It's got these fangs tucked underneath the head, which we'll look at in more closely in the next slide, and then the incredibly long antenna. And this antenna should actually be longer, but it's broken off at the end. This is another stone centipede, a different species. Uh, what should impress you immediately is the size of the fangs. Uh, these things inject venom. So if you were to pick up a centipede that's longer than about an inch, it might, it'll try and bite you and you might get a little sting. It won't be worse than a bee sting, but it'll be a little sting. And so what these centipedes do is they run up against their prey, they jab them with the fangs, and then tuck the prey up against these teeth, the prosternal teeth, to, to just pin it up against the jaw so that the prey can't escape. And then once it's subdued with venom, they can get to work eating. But centipede fangs have sort of been modified in different ways for different purposes. 
This is a, the same genus of centipedes that I showed in the graphs that uh, varied in segment number. Uh, Strigamia, which I think are quite beautiful centipedes. We have them here in New England. And I call them the can opener centipedes because on their claws, they've got a little extra, on their fangs, they've got a little extra claw right there. And it looks vaguely like a can opener. And you might say, well, you're just being very imaginative, but they actually use them very much like you would use a can opener to slice open the abdomens of their prey. And then they have this tiny head, which is a bit hard to see because it's up against the rest of the body. But they can insert their whole head into a prey item and just eat it out from the inside once, they've, once it's killed with venom. Oh. This is a very unique set of centipede fangs. Only the males of this species have fangs that look like this, where they're really long and leg-like. But I wanted to show you this picture because it makes it very obvious that actually centipede fangs are modified legs. If you look, they're segmented, just like any arthropod legs. So a long time ago, centipedes evolved from animals that didn't have fangs, and as they started to eat other animals and use their legs to catch prey, the front pair of legs were adapted to serving the function of fangs until eventually they got venom glands and served the purpose that they do now. But centipede legs can be modified in other ways. A lot of times male centipedes in, in, of the stone centipedes, so the, again, the ones with 15 pairs of legs, uh, have strange modifications on their legs. This one has a little tuft of hair. Both of these you could find in New England. Um, and this centipede is Nampabius fungiferopes. And I promise I won't throw too many Latin names at you, but I had to use that one because fungiferopes means fungus-like, and it's used to refer to the fact that this looks like a little mushroom growing out of, the, out of the side of the centipede's leg. And only the males have these, and no one knows what they're for. This is one of my favorites uh, because I actually have been doing a little bit of research on this centipede genus. Uh, in this one, the males only have a flattened area of uh, the femur on the last pair of legs and then this enormous spike. And I don't know what that's for. Presumably, the females can recognize it and maybe it helps them to recognize if they have a similar if they have another of the same species that they can make with. Uh, but actually, the bark centipedes, the, so some of the giant centipedes, have the weirdest legs. And this is one of my favorites. This is Theotops, and it's found throughout the eastern United States up to Connecticut. So we don't have them in Maine. Uh, but they have these pincher-like kind legs. And it's been thought that they might use them to capture prey, but that's not certain. No one's really shown that. Uh, but certainly, if you pick these centipedes up with a pair of tweezers, they'll use their hind legs to pinch the tweezers and simultaneously use their fangs to try and bite and inject venom. The most impressive centipedes are the giant centipedes in the family Scolopendridae. These can get up to 12 inches long in the tropics. Uh, we don't have any in New England. And a paper came out just last month detailing all of the different ways they use their hind legs. And I want to show you these ones. So this is, both, both sexes have these spines on the hind legs, and they can rear them up as a kind of display, almost like a, like a spider would rear up its front legs as a display. And they're brightly colored, and it can be quite intimidating. I mean, this is a big centipede. You would think twice before you pick that up. They're also used in, in mate recognition. Um, these, are, these are some other weird ones from the same paper. A lot of the thin legs are detachable, so if a predator were to grab them, they can be used as a distraction and they'll just drop off like a lizard's tail. These legs can be used as pinchers. And this weird one, uh, the one that looks like a flag, it's on the flag-tailed centipede, an eight-inch long centipede from Africa. And it turns out that they can actually rub these together and make a hissing noise. So if you can imagine an eight-inch long centipede hissing at you, you probably wouldn't try and eat that. Um, this is another interesting case of uh, centipedes using their legs in interesting ways. In both of these centipedes, which are scolopendrids, this one's from the desert southwest, this one's from India, uh, the, the rear part of the body mimics the front part of the body. And often when they're crawling, they will hold their hind legs up, sort of like antennae. And what this does is the hind part of the body is mimicking the front part of the body, so a bird that wants to attack the centipede will try and bite this end and be in for a very unpleasant surprise when the real head comes around and injects its venom. Some of these giant centipedes can have extremely painful bites uh, and certainly kill a small bird. 
so I've got a few more fun facts about centipedes before we move on to millipedes. So bark and soil centipedes, the ones with 21 or more pairs of legs, they care for their young. What they'll do is they'll find a spot in some rotting wood or some moss, lay their eggs and kind of surround them and clean them off of mold, but also guard them against predators. So if you were to poke at one, the centipede would probably try and bite you. And, it, and with the small ones, it's like having a tiny snake strike at you. It's pr actually pretty adorable. Uh, but if you disturb them too much, if they think that their young don't have much of a chance of surviving, they'll actually eat their own young because it's a waste of energy for them to invest a lot in young that won't survive. So if they feel that their young don't have a good chance, they'll eat them, recycle that energy, and put it towards a, fut a future brood that might do better. Uh, which makes these centipedes very frustrating to try and breed in captivity, if none of you have tried to do that, I bet. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I'm very relatable. Uh, so, uh, so this was an incident in an island off the coast of Greece. They were studying these vipers, which happened to be endangered, actually, and one of them, this is a young viper, tried to eat a giant centipede that was about six or seven inches long and the centipede actually ate its way out. It died in the process, but it ate its way out of the viper. And this sort of will impress upon you how awesome these animals are. Uh, but I also thought it was, it was a good story because it reminded me of those motivational posters that they give out in, at, at sports games with like, um, where the, the frog has got its head down the throat of the stork, but its, its hand is around and it says, don't give up, it wrapped around the, the stork's neck. Because even though it's being swallowed, it, it won't, won't give up. So I thought that this might make for a good motivational poster. <laughs> and then if you've watched David Attenborough's Life in the Undergrowth BBC series, he featured this um, in his documentary. But there are centipedes in Venezuelan caves, some of the largest species on Earth, up to a foot long, that hang down from the ceiling of the cave and snatch bats out of the air as they're flying by, like snakes do. Um, I don't think I can top that, so we're going to talk about millipedes now. <laughs> Uh, so this is an example of a millipede. If you were to look closely, you would see that it has two pairs of legs per segment, unlike the centipede. It's also heavily armored, uh, with kind of a shiny, calcified exoskeleton, relatively short antennae, and its head is smaller than the rest of its body. Unlike Strigamia, which uses its tiny head to insert its head into prey to eat them out, millipedes eat leaf litter and other decomposing plant stuff. So this millipede uses its face as kind of a wedge to burrow into difficult substrates like rotting wood. If you've ever tried to split wood with, it, with a wedge, you know that it's very effective because it, it's structured such that it pushes the wood out. And um, a lot of millipedes have heads that are structured like that. But this is also a millipede. Um, it looks like a caterpillar, and it's got little hairs all over it. Um, but you wouldn't mistake this for a caterpillar because it's about a millimeter long. Uh, we're, we'll talk more about these millipedes. And these are millipedes, too. So millipedes are incredibly diverse. Uh, there are about 12,000 species that, are, that have been documented, but there may be as many as, um, as eight times that or more in total that haven't been discovered. And they're also one of the oldest land animals. Um, the oldest fossil is 428 millions, million years old. This is the fossil. If you were to look at it, you wouldn't say that's a millipede, probably. but Invertebrate paleontologists are really good at seeing things that other people can't see. Uh, but it turns out that actually fossil trackways of millipedes are even older. So the oldest trace fossils of any land animals are the trackways of millipedes, 450 millions of years, million years old. Uh, they're the oldest land animals, and some of them were enormous. This is Arthropleura, and it's amazing not because it's the oldest millipede. The oldest millipedes are actually very tiny. But it's well known sort of in popular culture because it was about eight feet long, so the length of a small car. You could ride this millipede through the, the jungles of the Carboniferous. Uh, at the time, it, and even today, it's, it's the largest land arthropod that has ever lived. Um, and what, one of the cool things about Arthropleura is that its mouth parts haven't actually been discovered yet. So even though it's a millipede, and we can guess pretty well that it ate decomposing plant matter like all millipedes, uh, science fiction shows have had fun with that and have imaginatively given them fangs and made them predatory, because of course, technically, we don't have the mouth parts. So 
they could have been predatory. Uh, and of, so in science fiction shows, they're always predatory, and they attack people. Uh, if you were to try and guess what millipedes what we have now that are most closely related to Arthur Pleura, you'd probably guess the flat-backed millipedes, some of the larger ones. But actually, no, it's these uh, tiny, few millimeter long, caterpillar-like millipedes, the bristle millipedes, that are the oldest millipede lineage that we have today. They, you can find them under bark, and they eat uh, rotting wood and fungi and other materials they find. Oh. And you might think, why do they look kind of like caterpillars? Well, they're an example of convergent evolution, where two different animal groups have the same problem and solve it in the same way. It turns out that what they have in common with caterpillars is that they both are eaten by ants. And just as caterpillars use their hairs to detach and, uh, and discourage ants from eating them, these millipedes have hairs with little barbs. And when an ant tries to bite the millipede, all the hairs come off, coat the ant, and they interlock such that if the ant can't free itself, it may starve to death. Um, so, they're, so despite being really tiny, they're actually really well defended. This is not a millipede, it's a pill bug. It's an isopod, and it can roll up into a little ball, just like a millipede, and lives in similar habitats. And it's another example of convergent evolution with another group of millipedes, the pill millipedes. Uh, we don't have any of these in New England. They're very rare in North America. You can find them uh, occasionally in the southern Appalachians and the Pacific Northwest. Uh, but they've evolved convergently with, with pill bugs. They live in similar habitats and eat the same sorts of things, like rotting wood and dead leaves. If you were to go to Europe and you wanted to know how to tell the difference between these and wood lice, you could tell that because uh, when rolled up, these millipedes can't form a perfect sphere. They're always more of an oval. Of course, there are giant pill millipedes in the tropics. Uh, these, I can, I'm not going to say much more about these other than that they're really impressive and that rolled up, they could be the size of an orange. So, pretty amazing. We have these in New England. These are crested millipedes, and their backs are heavily armored, and they've got these ridges which actually add to the, the, the strength of the exoskeleton and make them more difficult to bite by, for example, salamanders or toads. The other interesting thing about these millipedes is that their heads are very tiny, and like as I said before, that's an adaptation to burrowing through soil and leaf litter. I made up this common name. Uh, you can think it's cheesy, but I called it, so. Um, these are the most common millipedes in New England. They're often very tiny, and they roll into spirals when you disturb them. These spots along the side of its body will disappear if you put this millipede in ethanol. The red will go away. And the reason isn't that they get discolored. The reason is that that red stuff is actually poison. And when you put it in ethanol to, to kill, kill it, to have a specimen, all the poison leaves, and the color goes away. We'll talk more about millipede poisons later. Um, there are giant millipedes that are similar to the snake millipedes, but in a different group. Of these, the only one that we have in New England is Narcissus annularis, and it has been recorded as far north as New Hampshire, and I'm trying to find it in Maine. So we will see if it actually lives in Maine. Uh, but these millipedes, this one can get five inches long, uh, so like as the size of your pinky finger, but some of the tropical giant millipedes can get over a foot long, and they're really very impressive animals. I wanted to show this one because this uh, is the scarlet red giant millipede, it's originally from Southeast Asia, and it's been introduced around the world in the tropics, so you can find it in southern Florida as well. The, the two reasons I wanted to share it is that, one, about a month ago, this millipede became the first millipede ever to have its genome fully sequenced. And earlier this year, the first centipede had its genome sequenced. So it's a good, been a good year for myriapods. Uh, and the second reason, and perhaps more importantly, is that this, I really thought this millipede looked like Slimy the Worm from Sesame Street. Uh, so I'll... You have that, at least, <laughs> to take home. Uh, these are the feather millipedes, and it's very difficult to tell which end is the head and which end is the tail. You pretty much have to look under the microscope and find the antennae. But they move extremely slowly, like slugs, and they live in, on rotting wood and eat away at the wood. Uh, and sometimes if you peel bark off rotting logs, you can find a whole colony of them like this. Most millipedes don't care for their young, but these ones do. Unlike the centipedes, they aren't predatory, so they don't eat their own eggs if they get tired. 
Uh, but they do guard them and they clean them off from fungi, and they have toxic secretions that they put out to prevent predators from attacking their eggs. We don't have any beaked millipedes here. They're called beaked millipedes because, they're, because their mouth parts are like tubes, and they stick them into mushrooms and suck out the juices. The reason I wanted to share uh, beaked millipedes is because I always get asked what myriapod has the most, number, the most legs, and how many legs is that? Well, it turns out that this species, Alacne planinipes, has 750 legs. Uh, and it's found in central California, deep in the soil. Um, and if you thought that was amazing, it turns out that this whole, this whole millipede is about an inch long. So all of those 750 legs fit into an inch, uh, which I think, is, I think that's pretty incredible. Uh, some of the most diverse millipedes are the flat-backed millipedes. These have big armored plates covering their back. These are all kinds that you can find in Maine. Um, the, this one is introduced from Europe. It's called the greenhouse millipede, and it's been introduced in potted plants, and it likes to live in greenhouses, although it can live almost anywhere. Some of the polydesmids, or the flat-backed millipedes, are very beautiful. Uh, these are in the family Zistodesmidae, which I am also trying to find in Maine. I haven't seen them, but they very well may live here. Uh, and they're called cherry millipedes because if you were to pick them up, these, these are very big millipedes. They get um, two inches long or longer. And if you were to pick them up and smell them, they smell like cherries or I think more like roasted almonds. Um, but you don't want to smell them for too long because the reason they smell like that is that they are puffing out hydrogen cyanide <laughs> as a gas. So hydrogen cyanide is a gas at room temperature, so they are constantly just puffing it out. This is the last group of millipedes I want to share with you. These we don't have in North America. They're found only in East Asia. But I think they're a, a, just an incredible group of millipedes. If you were to look at the exoskeleton, it's sort of sculptured like a basketball with little round knobs. I spent 15 minutes last night trying to look up the term for the knobs on a basketball, and I still don't know what they are. But they have those, and they're covered in little spines. And the area between the, um, uh, the, sorry, the back plates is also covered in spines that look sort of like shark's teeth. But what's amazing about this millipede is it's only like five millimeters long. It's an incredibly tiny animal, and it's found only in caves in China and Southeast Asia. But that's not the coolest member of that family. Actually, it's this one, uh, which was discovered just in 2009. Uh, its species name, Aster, means star, and you're, what you're looking at now is the side of the millipede, uh, as it's rolled up, if it were to unfurl and start walking around, it, these uh, spines would stick up like a stegosaurus or some kind of dragon or something. Uh, and, pr and probably this functions in defense and makes them a little more difficult to eat, is my guess, but no one really knows. Uh, the, the only thing we know for sure about these millipedes that's actually been studied is where do they live and what are they? Um, there are actually very few people in the world who study millipedes and centipedes, and as a result, there's a lot left to learn about their natural history. One thing we do know about millipedes, though, is that although they're heavily armored and have various physical defenses, they're also really good at chemical defense. Each group of millipedes has its own chemical arsenal. Uh, this is a pill millipede uh, from Europe, and these molecules are glomerin and hemoglomerin, and they're named after the the millipede, which are in the, the millipedes, which are in the order of Glomerida, and these molecules are only found in pill millipedes. Uh, they're not found nowhere else in the world, and we don't know exactly what they do, except that they do deter predators like salamanders and rodents and spiders. And apparently, they act as an anesthetic. Well, they put spiders to sleep. If a spider tries to bite this millipede, it gets very drowsy and starts wobbling around. Uh, the the giant millipedes, for the chemist in the room, are loaded with benzoquinones. And this is a yellowish toxin. If it gets on your skin, it can give you a chemical burn. Uh, the ones that we have in New England, so this species, if you get this stuff on your skin, it'll turn it purple, but you won't feel any pain. It's just weak enough that it won't hurt you. But if you were to pick up some of the 12-inch long African species, they can actually give you blisters. And certainly, you don't want to eat any of these millipedes. I, I always say that mostly jokingly because I can just imagine a little kid, you know, they're very brightly colored and they, they look like a snack, right? Um, 
I already told you that the flat-backed millipedes puff out hydrogen cyanide, which, I mean, the name, you know that's toxic. Uh, and as I said, it's a gas at room temperature. And so they're just constantly secreting it and puffing it out. It's, it's, it's really nasty stuff. <laughs> so if, if you're a millipede biologist and you go around collecting these things, it's very tempting to smell them all the time. But you've got to be careful not to do that too much. Uh, despite being walking cyanide bombs, uh, millipedes are eaten by a lot of animals. These are two animals that don't eat only millipedes, but they like to eat millipedes a lot. Toads, uh, millipedes cons constitute a, a very significant part of their diet uh, for reasons that we don't know. As it just so happens that toads are very toxic as well. This is, is a very large scorpion from Africa, from Central Africa, where there are really giant millipedes. And Although this scorpion will eat all sorts of other arthropods, it especially likes giant millipedes. Um, again, for reasons that defy me. But there are specialists, there are animals that eat only millipedes. If you want to specialize on millipedes, you've got to be clever about it. So if you want to eat a millipede, you have to get past the outer layer where all of the toxins are and get to the insides where everything's all juicy and delicious. And assassin bugs are especially qualified to do that because they've got a little beak up here at their mouth, as a mouth, that they can stick into their prey and just suck out all the liquids. And there's a particular assassin bug, Virginia cruciata. This is found in the United States. You could see it in Maine. Um, and it specializes on millipedes. This is a dung beetle. And dung beetles are not assassin bugs. They're harmless. They're cute. They waddle around. They roll their little balls of dung, or in this case, the dismembered body parts of millipedes in Africa. So this particular dung beetle is the only known predatory dung beetle. For whatever reason, it decided that it didn't want to cart around balls of dung all day, and it uses its spade-like legs and face to just pry apart, and just rip apart millipede segments into manageable pieces that it can then roll around and eat and lay its eggs in. <laughs> I love this picture. It just looks like complete destruction um, a lot of animals that eat millipedes have good reasons for doing so. So a lot of poison frogs in South America and Central America eat millipedes and ants and other toxic animals to harvest their toxins. The toxins on this frog originally came from a millipede that it ate, which is, happens to be this kind of millipede, a pretty little purple animal. And millipede toxins can be useful in other ways. A story recently was featured in New York Times about how monkeys will grind up millipedes into a kind of paste and rub them all over their bodies. And it wasn't known why they did this until recently. It turns out that millipede toxins, at least of this group, the orthoporus, these are big millipedes, like six inches long, are a very useful insect repellent. And so monkeys use them to repel mosquitoes. Uh, Millipedes can have all sorts of intricate relationships with other animals. Uh, I've been showing you a lot of predators, so you might think that these ants are eating millipedes, but actually what's going on is very different. These are army ants in South America, and you can see by the huge jaws that they are predatory. And they, I mean, I'm sure you've seen a documentary with, with army ants, or at least heard about them. They, they go through the jungle in trains and eat anything in their path. Uh, but there are millipedes that actually use chemicals not as a defense, but to mimic the pheromones of army ants so that millipedes can walk through army ant trains unharmed. And the millipedes aren't eating the army ants or anything, but they get protection from the fact that they are in a swarm of biting and stinging ants, uh, which any bird would be foolish to try and pick through. And it turns out that they even have relationships with plants. Most millipedes don't eat live plants, so if you find them in, the, in your garden, they aren't eating your vegetables. They only eat plants after it started to decompose and is died. Uh, but just a few years ago, this millipede was discovered in, in the mountains of Colombia. And they discovered that it actually has mosses that grow on it. So mosses reproduce by making spores and just blasting them out through the environment. And if a spore lands on a millipede, typically it won't germinate. But if it lands on this millipede, it will. And not only does this millipede carry mosses, but it can carry up to 10 different species of mosses at a time. So I like to compare this uh, 
millipede, just the, the mythical turtle that some religions say uh, holds the whole world on its back. You know, have you ever heard that the whole world is on the back of a turtle? Well, there's a whole ecosystem on the back of a millipede in, north, in the mountains of Colombia. Uh, so the question then, you, you, I hope that by now you don't need a reason to think that millipedes and centipedes are worth knowing about. I happen to think that amazing things are just worth knowing about by themselves, but millipedes and centipedes are actually quite important to us. Uh, this is a forest, this is a hemlock forest in northern Washington in the Cascade Mountains. And you can see it's covered in twigs and needles and leaves, and all of that stuff is nutrients that somehow will benefit the forest, right? Trees will get that nutrients and recycle it. But in order to do that, all the nutrients in this stuff has to get into the soil and into a form that trees can use. And that doesn't just happen by accident. There's a whole, a whole line of succession of invertebrates and other animals that, that do that. And among them are millipedes. So I've got a few animals here that participate in this. Springtails, woodlice, earthworms, and millipedes help to break down leaf litter and rotting wood and other vegetable matter that ends up on the forest floor so that bacteria can then recycle that and then it becomes soil that plants can use to <coughs> nourish themselves. So millipedes are important, but millipedes are kind of, I want to say cute, I think they're cute. I think they're sort of adorable, they're slow moving, they're harmless, they can't bite you. Uh, but what use could centipedes possibly be? Well, centipedes eat all of these different animals. Uh, so they are an important component of the ecosystem. But centipedes are also useful to us in another specific way that's only been discovered very recently. Um, we now know that centipede venom is extremely complex. It compl contains hundreds of different neurotoxins, each of which is a complex protein. And just in the past few years, st scientists have started to look at these proteins and what they do. It turns out that in this giant centipede from China, they have a protein that is structured similarly to morphine. And if you inject just this protein into mice, it relieves pain. And it uses the same molecular pathway as morphine. So it relieves pain in the same way, but more effectively. Um, but just to clarify, I always get asked this. If you inject centipede venom into you, it's not a pain click, it's not a painkiller. It's the opposite. Centipede venom has evolved over millions of years to make you hurt as much as possible, because they don't want you to, to bother them again. It's just this, this particular protein, if you isolate it from centipede venom, uh, can be useful as, as morphine. And this is just one of a, only a few proteins that have been looked at in centipedes. It's very likely that other useful applications will be found in the future, because this is a field that's just starting. Um, and with that, I'm going to leave my work set up here, but I would like to ask for questions. Is that about time for that? So if you have any questions about millipedes and centipedes, now is the time. And uh, please wait for me to get you a microphone. I'll get yours first. You talked about defensively shedding the legs, and uh, are they eventually regenerated through the molting process, or is that guy SOL? Um, if, they, if they lose the leg before they reach adulthood, they will molt and gain a new leg. But after adulthood, they stop molting. So if they lose it after they've reached adulthood, even they those ornate functional back legs, right. the larger ones. Yeah. Thank you. And often with stone centipedes, which run around with those legs held up, it's very common for them not to, to not have hind legs, which is frustrating for me because I often need them to identify the centipede. Uh, what can you learn from uh, population studies of centipedes and millipedes in an area like this, for example, we've been collecting centipedes and millipedes, so uh, when we know what's there, uh, how does that help you as a scientist? Um, well, that's a tricky question because uh, the study of millipedes and centipedes is effectively handicapped by the fact that almost probably five people in the country actually know how to identify them. And beyond that, we know almost nothing about their natural history. So we know what species are there, 
we don't know what they're actually doing. We know that the centipedes are predatory and the millipedes aren't, but beyond that, it's hard to know specifics. So a lot of the real knowledge that'll come from this is, is down the line after we know a little bit more about these animals. It's kind of a data poor area. It's extremely data poor. Um, a, a, lot of the, a lot of the millipedes I, and centipedes I showed you in this, uh, in, in this I, I took pictures from the publications where the species were described, and those species have not been mentioned in any publications since then. In other words, they were discovered, described, and no one's done anything with them since. Any other questions? Well, thank you very much. Oh, sorry. Uh, you said there was a, a European species discovered recently in New York City. And it's always so interesting how anybody gets to New York City. So I'm wondering uh, if you care to speculate how that might have yeah. happened. Yeah. Well, there's a, actually a story there because several decades ago, that centipede, which is common in Europe, it's a very long soil centipede, was found in a potted plant that had just, been, just arrived in New York City. This was in, the, I think, the 50s. And at the time, they hadn't been found, there no populations had been found in New York City, so it was assumed that this was just one that arrived in a potted plant and it was done. The invasion ended. But I've been in, communicating with a person from New York City who, who studies the insect fauna of, of inner city parks, and he found some of these centipedes and showed them to me, and I decided they're actually this European species. So there is a population. But it goes even further because actually, a few years ago, a species of centipede completely new to science was found in New York City, in an inner, in an inner city park. And they know that the centipede is introduced because it belongs to a group of centipedes that's only found uh, in another part of the world, I think in Southeast Asia. Uh, but it's the first new species to be found in New York City in many years. <laughs> so. Central Park. In Central Park, as I recall. Yeah, yeah. So this morning, coming in, not knowing what we would come into, this is fascinating. And um, with your talk being so specific, but yet gearing it in so many ways for people to learn at the same time. Is there a, a conscious effort among the group of five that can identify them to try to make it more attainable for folks to appreciate them and to see them, you know, the stone centipede, the, the house, yeah. just, just finding any, your mention of, the, of connecting that image with uh, Sesame Street. Is there, is there a, uh, an mm, attempt no. or is that personal? I don't want to. I don't want to be rude to them because they're very busy people, and, and they would love to connect with the public. But but no. <laughs> <laughs> um. Well, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. So thank you. Um. I just wanted to follow up for you. He actually has a blog. It's very interesting. He didn't. <laughs> Talk it's about my dad, that, so he's called, obligated uh, to. It's called Beautiful Nightmares, and he writes it in such a way that it's very accessible to the general public. And you might want to look up his name with centipedes or Google if you remember Beautiful Nightmares. If, and you can get a lot more information that way. I, um, I, I should mention if any of you know of the website called bugguide.net, it's a website where you can upload an image of an insect or another bug or arthropod that you find, and experts will identify it. And I'm on that website, so if you put a picture on that, of a centipede on that website, I will try and identify it for you. So that's one way if you are interested and you find one in your garden or something and you want to identify it. I'll do my best. Uh, I think we'll hold question, questions there. Well, actually, we'll give... No, all I want to know is, uh, are they all egg layers versus live layers? Uh, yeah. Egg layers? Yes. Yeah, the ones that don't protect their eggs lay single eggs and sort of in the dirt and just leave them. No. Yeah. Okay, so in the interest of the rest of the morning, we'll give you a big round of applause. Please. And I mentioned that Joseph is from the University of Connecticut. Some other 
very important partners that take place, uh, that, that help us pull off the annual bio blitz. And um, Dana reminded me when he raised his hand, the main entomological society is very instrumental in, in helping us. Um, in fact, over 40%, 40 to 60% of the participants come from the main entomological society. We also have other partners in the University of New Hampshire, the University of Maine, Maine Forest Service, and the U.S. Forest Service, and the um, Maine Natural History Observatory. So all of those um, partners, agencies, help to pull this off. And that's really what the Scudic Institute is about, partnering up with as many folks as we can to bring science to the public and to educate you all, and on occasion involve you with the research. So the next step this morning, for those of you that are interested, and this is a very large crowd. We'll make it work. We'll make it work. Many feet. Yes. <laughs> um, we will assemble, for those that are interested, we're going to take a little walk, a very short walk, although it's going to be off the pavement and on the grass to get to a spot that Joseph set up with um, logs and things that we hauled out of the forest. And he is going to demonstrate how one would actually look for millipedes. Um, yesterday when we were in the field, we would pile out of the cars and some of us had nets and things like that, of course, trying to catch bees and wasps. Others were on the ground looking for ants and things. And I noticed that Joseph would zip off. And, and it was like, at one point I came back to him and said, okay, you got to give up the search image for these millipedes because I was going out and turning over logs and I couldn't find a one. He'd come back with vials filled <laughs> with three or four. And um, so he knows how to do it. And if you want to learn, let's all go outside and, and uh, see how that's done. So we'll assemble out front just as soon as you can without stampeding one another. Thank you very much.